I'll see if I can share the, the screen. Yes, please do so. Um, is this working? You should be seeing my presentation now. Uh, not yet, uh, but sometimes there are some lags and delays. But nothing is switching yet. Okay. Mm. Um, it's just connecting. Let me try that again. Hmm. Ah. Okay, something's happening. Yes. Yes, we can see this. It's look, looking good now. Okay, is it, uh, it should be visible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Thomas Hamelrick from the University of Copenhagen. Thomas, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you see the, can you see the, the pointer? Uh, yes, we can see this okay, small, good. small mouse arrow. Yeah, then we're, we're all set. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks for the, the, the invitation. So this is the, the first talk in a series of, uh, of three. So this will be a kind of a high level talk that serves as an, uh, an introduction to, uh, to the other talks. Um, and um, so the topic of the day will be deep probabilistic programming. So I will explain what it is and uh, I will explain also what our specific interest is and that is applying deep probabilistic programming uh, to the, the uh, protein folding problem or the, the uh, problem of predicting uh, protein structure. So these are the three talks. So today, uh, so it's me, um, deep probabilistic programming and the pro uh, protein folding problem. Then uh, the 9th of February, yes? Was there a, a question or? No, no, no it's, uh, it's somebody is coming or leaving. Okay, just a glitch. Okay. Beach, so beach, the, 9th, the 9th of February, um, uh, Christian Tugesson is going to give a talk. So Christian is an industrial PhD student who's uh, both at the university and at uh, Evaction, which is a company that uses AI to do uh, vaccine design. And we've been doing this uh, before uh, vaccine design became uh, fashionable, so to say. So in that talk will be called Efficient Generative Modeling of Protein Structure Fragments Using a Deep Markov Model. And then the 16th of February, uh, Ola, uh, another PhD student, will uh, talk about uh, inference of, uh, of deep models. And that talk will be called uh, Elbow Within Stein, General and Integrated Stein Variation Inference. So, and I'll provide some background so that these, uh, these talks uh, are, are set in some perspective. Okay, so I guess that not all of you will be uh, familiar with protein structure. So I have some introductory slides that uh, uh, explain you what proteins are all about. So this here is a, a, an artist impression of, a, of a, a cell. And a cell contains about 50% uh, proteins. And, and here in the, this picture, you can see, for example, these, uh, these, these purple shapes and these blue shapes. These are all protein, this proteins, this thing here, um, this, this green thing that sticks out of the cell, this is a flagella that, uh, that the bacteria uses to, uh, to move around. And here you see the, the, the DNA of the cell and also this DNA is packed using proteins. So, um, so, so proteins are very important and about half of, of, of the cell uh, is actually made up of proteins. So proteins, um, they come in different sizes and different shapes. So every protein has a specific shape. And uh, here you see a couple of, of uh, proteins that are important for, for various purposes. So you see, for example, here insulin, um, uh, which is a hormone. You see here trypsin, um, which is um, um, uh, trypsin, which is a, a, an enzyme that, uh, um, that is important for digestion. Uh, this is a blood protein. Um, you see here an antibody. Um, which is, of course, important for our immune defense. Hemoglobin is a blood transporter. Uh, ATP synthase is involved in, uh, in energy uh, householding. 
and a generation of energy. And you can see that all of these proteins have a specific shapes and their specific shapes are important for their function. So structure is function. This is of course why people are, uh, are very interested in, in knowing the, the three-dimensional shape of a protein because the three-dimensional shape is, is very much tied to its, uh, its function. And this is also used in drug design. So here to the right, you see a, uh, a, uh, a protein called a serotonin receptor. And uh, you see here in, in, uh, in blue, uh, a drug called ergotamine that binds to this protein. This is an anti-migraine uh, drug. And so the, the, the shape of this, of this small molecule is important because uh, it, it fits into the shape of the protein. And so knowing the three-dimensional shape of a protein is a great help um, to, um, to, to, to design drugs and to develop uh, various forms of th therapeutics. And this is one of the reasons why the, the protein structure prediction problem is, is so important. Now, proteins are linear polymers. And uh, so here you see this schematically depicted. So here you have this linear polymer. And if you bring a protein in a watery environment then the protein will, will fold up, it will fold onto itself and it will, um, it will form a compact conformation. Not all proteins do that. Some proteins are very flexible, so they, they move around. But uh, many proteins, the majority of proteins folds into this nice compact structure. So this is a self-assembling nanomachine. So this process is spontaneous. So you can just make a protein sequence artificially, put it into water, and it will fold uh, by itself into a three-dimensional shape. So the sequence of an amino acid, so the sequence is the, the order of the amino acids in the, in the linear polymer. So the, the sequence determines the three-dimensional structure. And, and this uh, provided uh, Christian Amfinsen, uh, you see him here to the right, with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, in 1972. So he discovered that uh, sequence um, is the sequence of a protein is enough to determine its three-dimensional structure. No additional uh, helpers are uh, in principle needed. So proteins are very complicated uh, objects. You see here three different representations of the same protein. So this is, I used to be an X-ray crystallographer. So this is one of the proteins that I, uh, I determined during my PhD. So this is a protein called PHAL and that, uh, that is present in certain beans. And uh, it's a protein that is very toxic for, uh, for insects, but also for humans. And so this is the reason that these beans um, need, to, um, uh, need to be cooked uh, very, very much because you want to, to denature, want to unfold this protein. Otherwise it binds to your gut and you get, uh, you get terribly sick. So um, it's complicated. So here to the left, you see a, um, a um, you see a, uh, a uh, let's say an, uh, a schematic depiction of the of the protein. So with with these arrows are are beta strands, and these these uh, the, the loop regions are here shown as these uh, the, these coils. In the middle, you see the 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 linear polymer part. So the the bonds between atoms are shown as as sh uh, short. Uh, sticks, short segments, and the, the colors denote different atoms. And here to the right, you see um, you see nearly all atoms. So nearly all bonds of, in the protein are are, uh, are depicted. Not all of them. In fact, the hydrogens are not shown. So, but you can see that this is a tremendously complicated object. And one of the challenges that that we are very interested in is is how how can you formulate uh, probabilistic uh, models of of such complicated uh, complicated objects. So um, as I said, so a protein folds uh, spontaneously when you bring it into water into a compact conformation. So what's the driving force behind it? Well, some amino acids, uh, they are hydrophobic amino acids. That means that they, they try to, uh, to avoid water. Other amino acids are water-loving amino acids, hydrophilic amino acids. They want to be exposed to water. So in this uh, picture, the, the black amino acids are hydrophobic amino acids, so they try to get away from water. The white ones are hydrophilic amino acids, so they want to be exposed to water. And this is the driving force behind the compactification. So typically what happens is that you, the protein folds such, such as the, the hydrophobic amino acids, they end up in the, in the middle, and the hydrophilic amino acids, they uh, end up on the surface of the molecule. So this is the driving force 
behind a compactification of, of protein structure. So it's, it's basically separation between oil and water. Uh, it's basically, it basically corresponds to what happens when you try to mix oil with water, right? You can shake it around. It becomes this uh, milky emulsion. And then if you put the, the, that, uh, that emulsion on the table and you let it stand there, then it will uh, undergo a separation into phases and the oil will float on top of the water. So that's basically what happens when a protein falls. Now, what's the degree of freedom from a mathematical point of view if you go from the unfolded state uh, to the folded state? Well, um, so this is uh, shown here to the right. So um, you see here a part of the, the protein backbone here in gray. So this is the linear polymer part. And this is the side chain of an amino acid. And so there are bond angles involved. So that's uh, if you have three atoms that's the angle between these two uh, consecutive uh, the two consecutive bonds that connect these three atoms. Then you also have bond lengths; they can vary a bit. And these two degrees of freedom are they are significant, but they're not uh, they're not crucial. The crucial degree of freedom are the dihedral angles, and the dihedral angle is is something that involves four atoms. So, for example, this chi one uh, dihedral angle over here. So this um, is the dihedral angle of these four atoms and these dihedral angles so, so basically it's the angle that is made by this segment and this segment when you look along this bond so this is the this is a dihedral angle and and the ma what mainly happens when a protein goes from an unfolded conformation to a folded conformation is that these dihedral angles these uh, these change so protein structure prediction to a great extent is basically predicting these these dihedral angles because if you have the correct dihedral angles uh, then you can also then you can basically come up with the correct uh, three dimensional structure so let's now take a look at protein structure prediction. So let's take a look at the, the history of protein structure prediction in a, in a nutshell. So the, the, the first successful computational method to predict protein structure was basically, um, basically came out in 1997. And that was a method called uh, Rosetta, which uh, comes from the, the University of Washington, the group of uh, David Baker. It was published in the Journal of Molecular Biology. So, and um, this, this software was also used in 2003 to design the first protein that had a, a novel fold, so a novel three-dimensional shape that had not been observed before uh, in nature. So this is basically protein design. This was a great uh, hallmark in the, in the history of protein structure prediction. So what's the big idea behind Rosetta? Well, the... The, the big idea was to, to make use of so-called fragment libraries. So, so in, instead of, um, of predicting the, the, the structure of a, of a protein ab initio based on, on, on physical considerations and physical energies, um, Rosetta used a library of small fragments that were, were derived from known protein structures. So this is basically a Lego approach. So, so you try to assemble proteins using fragments that you know uh, occur in real proteins, and then you combine that with some uh, with some energy uh, functions, and then you try to come up with a conformation that has a, a low energy, but that also uh, consists of existing local fragments. So this was a very uh, a very groundbreaking idea, and and uh, and this idea is still uh, being used in many approaches for protein design and for protein structure prediction. So that was the first great progress, 1997. So the first uh, really good results, um, limited results, but good results with respect to predicting the, the three-dimensional uh, three dimensional structure of proteins. So fast forward to 2011. So another uh, hallmark, uh, we have EV fold here. So that was pu published in uh, PLOS One in 2011. So this was a, a, another um, important idea. And again, an idea that is still uh, crucial for protein structure prediction today, and that's also used in the in the in the celebrated uh, alpha fold uh, method, and and the idea is, is as follows: so instead of, of uh, so you can you can use uh, aligned sequences, so you can use sequences that are are similar to the the sequence of the protein that you want to want to predict, and align all of these sequences, and then you're going to take a look at which amino acids in these sequences um, mutate in tandem. So for example, here you see these two positions. So you have these aligned sequences. So 
each sequence corresponds to one protein. So these are all related proteins. And uh, if you know your, your amino acids, then you can see that you that uh, it seems that you all these these two amino acids, this pair of amino acid acids, is always uh, involved in a favorable interaction. So in this case, R and D corresponds to a favorable electrostatic interaction, K and E the same, and W and V corresponds to a favorable hydrophobic interaction. So why, why do these amino acids always change such that they actually interact in a favorable way? Well, one of the explanations could be, well, they do that because they are close together in the three-dimensional shape. So even though they are far apart in the sequence, if they change, if they mutate in tandem, if there are correlations among their mutations, that might indicate that they are close together in the three-dimensional structure. So by examining the pattern of mutations in aligned sequences of uh, related proteins, you could get an idea of which amino acids are close together in the three-dimensional structure, and you can use this information uh, to predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein. This is a key idea, and this is still the basic idea that is, is used by, by uh, current deep learning methods, notably by, by the AlphaFold method. So this is one of the, one of the real crucial ideas that, um, that were used to, to solve uh, the, the protein structure problem. So now we, uh, we uh, go forward again, and we are now in, in 2018 and in 2020. And this is where DeepMind's AlphaFold uh, enters uh, the scene. So the CASP uh, competition is, uh, you can think of that as the Olympic Games of protein structure prediction. So this is about um, trying to predict the structure of proteins uh, whose structure is actually known, but not yet made public. And then the predictions are compared with the real structure. And this is a very good way to find out which methods actually work and which methods uh, do not work. And this is very important, this, this kind of a, this blind prediction approach was very important because before that, it was very difficult to, to judge the merit of different uh, methods because there was a lot, apparently there was a lot of bias due to the fact that, that people were optimizing their methods um, with respect to known protein structures. So CASP gave us a, a fairly objective way to figure out which methods worked to what extent. So in, in CASP 13, in 2018, so there was a report from the, the CASP evaluators and, and uh, they uh, uh, um, stated that uh, DeepMind's AlphaFold, so the first version of AlphaFold in 2018, um, um, uh, presented an un unprecedented progress in the ability of computational methods to predict protein structure. Then two years later, in 2020, an even more dramatic um, um, uh, message uh, was conveyed. And uh, basically, the CASP organizer stated that an artificial intelligence solution to the challenge has been found. So basically, the protein structure prediction um, problem has been solved. And it has been solved by AI, by artificial intelligence, not by, by physical energy, uh, by physical uh, um, by modeling the, the physics behind, behind the problem, but by artificial intelligence. And moreover, it's not been solved by an academic group, but by a, a company, by uh, DeepMind. So this is the, this is the, the press release that uh, was released about AlphaFold 2 in CASP 14. So this is in December 2020. So, and uh, it stated, so that it, this was uh, Monday, uh, the, actually it was the end of November. And uh, so the title of this press release was Artificial Intelligence Solution to a 50-Year-Old Science Challenge Could Revolutionize Medical Research. So this is the AlphaFold pipeline. Um, just very briefly, how does it work? Well, it makes use of these uh, sequence alignments, um, just as I explained for the EVFold um, method. So using these uh, multiple sequence alignments and then uh, examining correlated mutations it gives you a lot of information on which, uh, which amino acids are close together in the three-dimensional space. It also uses a representation of the, of the, uh, the distances in, uh, between all the amino acids uh, in, the, in the protein. So this is a so-called uh, distance map. So this distance map is, is uh, available if you have some uh, related structures to the, to the uh, protein that you want to predict. So these two inputs, they are... Uh, uh, fed into a an, uh, uh, into a, a set of neural networks, which is called an evil former, which uh, combines information uh, on, the, on the pair representation with the multiple sequence alignment. 
It then produces a uh, latent representation of the protein structure and also an, uh, an estimate of the, of the distance map. This is then uh, fed into uh, something called a structure module, uh, which uh, has a cloud of amino acids, basically, that are, uh, that are moved uh, through space into the correct position based on this latent representation and also on the, on the distance map uh, representation. Now, finally, a 3D structure is produced together also with an assessment of the, of the confidence. So which regions have a high confidence of prediction and uh, which regions have a low confidence of prediction. So this is also an iterative method. So, um, so the first prediction is then recycled and used as input and, uh, and the, the, the process is repeated. So it's, uh, it's an iterative process and the, the, the predictions are recycled a number of times. So let's take a look uh, a bit at uh, how CASP uh, is doing. So, um, so it can it can predict really big proteins up to a couple of thousands of residues, and you can do domain packing. It's very precise, so it can uh, uh, it can uh, predict uh, the C alpha um, uh, the RMS uh, C alpha RMSD. So root mean square deviation is uh, down to zero point nine six angstrom. That's basically um, atomic resolution. So you can see here to the right that it's a lot better than, than all the other competing methods in, uh, in CASP-14. And it's also quite fast. So for a small protein of uh, 250 residues takes half a minute, 400 residues takes one minute, 2,500 residues takes a couple of hours. So this is both very accurate and very, uh, very precise. And this is quite a spectacular process, uh, progress in the, in the field of protein structure prediction. Is it solved? Um, well, um, that depends on your, uh, your perspective, of course. And here are a couple of, of, uh, of aspects of the problem where you can, you can, uh, expect some, uh, or where, where some progress is, is still possible. So first of all, what AlphaFold does is it predicts the final three-dimensional structure. So it doesn't model the folding process itself. So typically the folding process is simulated using a, uh, uh, an empirical force field, such for example, the amber force field, which you see here on the slide. So and if this represents uh, approximately the physical interactions in the protein water system, and, and, and this can be used to actually fold proteins. So we don't have, a, we don't have an efficient uh, method yet to actually predict the folding process itself. So alpha fold predicts the final outcome. Another thing, another limitation of AlphaFold, this comes from a, uh, an, an article that was uh, published this month in Nature Structural Biology. Another uh, limitation is that uh, AlphaFold is not really good at predicting uh, missense uh, mutations. These are structure disrupting uh, mutations um, that uh, disrupt the three dimensional structure of a protein. And this is very important because such mutations. Um, they play a role in uh, protein aggregation, misfolding, and dysfunction. And, and these processes play roles in, in important diseases such as Alzheimer and, and Parkinson. So here to the right, you see an example of a, of a protein, so a protein called UBA, ubiquitin-associated domain. And um, so it's known that a mutation at position 189 of a leucine into an alanine actually destables the fold of, of this protein. And, and causes it to unfold. But if you use alpha fold and you try to predict the structure of this uh, mutation, then basically alpha fold will, will tell you that the structure of the protein changes very, very little. So it doesn't, it cannot, uh, uh, it cannot um, pick up these, these small differences, like let's say a point mutation that destabilizes the entire fold. So in this article, um, the, the authors conclude that alpha fold two is largely unable to predict when a point mutation caused defective protein folding. Another limitation is uh, modeling the dynamics of proteins, so modeling disorder. So 30% of all proteins have intrinsically disordered regions. That means that these regions are dynamic. They move around, um, as you can see here in the center of the, of, the, of the slide. So this is a protein called P27CTD. So this is one of those disordered proteins. It's very dynamic. So if you use alpha fold to do the prediction, then alpha fold will come up with a single confirmation over here. So it's not really useful to, um, to investigate the, the dynamics of proteins uh, uh, that, are, are, that do not, or only to uh, a partial extent, adopt a, a rigid three-dimensional structure. 
So from a statistical point of view, um, so what we really want to do, want to uh, uh, want to develop is a a probabilistic model that um, that can uh, that can deal with epistemic uncertainty and that can deal with aleatory uncertainty. So what does that mean in this context? Well, the epistemic uncertainty deals with measurement noise. So X-ray crystallography, NMR, these are very they can be very noisy processes. So these protein structures that we have, the protein structures that are used to train these methods, they are they contain noise. There are limited amounts of data. The, the uh, probabilistic models might be limited. Uh, and, uh, and we also might have, have to deal with shortcomings in the inference method. So these are very complicated models, including uh, often using uh, very large neural networks. And it's very challenging to do uh, parameter estimation, let alone uh, Bayesian estimation of such models. So that's epistemic uncertainty. We're also interested in modeling aleatory uncertainty, that is intrinsic uncertainty and that in in the case of proteins corresponds to modeling dynamics and disorder so it corresponds to to modeling the movements that are going on uh, in in proteins and even even well folded proteins even proteins that adopt uh, rigid three-dimensional structures they can still have some uh, dynamical aspects to them as you can see here to the right this is an, uh, an ensemble of 44 crystal structures of uh, lysozyme so this is a, a protein that is not disordered so it falls into a specific three-dimensional structure but you can see here that some re regions are actually quite dynamic uh, and uh, and this dynamic uh, these dynamics are very significant for their function so it would be very nice uh, to have a method that that could predict these uh, these features so we can conclude that basically the the prediction of protein structure um, including dynamics and including um, uh, a, a, a precise representation of the epistemic uncertainty, we can conclude that this uh, the protein folding problem is still a, a paradigm problem or constitutes a paradigm problem for uh, computational and uh, directional, that is, non-Euclidean uh, statistics. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some probabilistic models of protein structure. So my group has been involved with... Um, with uh, developing probabilistic models of protein structure for uh, uh, quite a few years. And uh, so in 2006, we uh, published some, uh, a model called FB5HMM, uh, and uh, we had a number of, uh, of papers uh, uh, around a model called TORUS-DBN. Um, so these, these models were uh, uh, are, or are probabilistic models of, of what protein structures uh, look like on a, on a local length scale, so they don't, can't really be used for uh, full-blown 3D structure prediction methods, but they can represent the local shapes uh, of proteins. So and this was a uh, work that, uh, that uh, it was joint uh, work that was done with uh, uh, John Kent and Kanti Mardia. And these are uh, uh, statisticians at the University of, of Leeds, and they are experts in directional statistics and as the, the statistics of non uh, Euclidean data, and this is very important for protein structure prediction, as we are working with uh, often working with dihedral angles and, and things such as that. So in this case, uh, we formulated a probabilistic model of local protein structure by using a hidden Markov model with uh, continuous output. So the continuous output concerning the the, the angles, so the five psi angles uh, that can be uh, used to parameterize the three-dimensional protein structure, and then also the amino acid sequence which you see over here. So basically, um, you feed in the amino acid sequence, you infer the probability distribution over the hidden states, and that allows you um, to um, obtain a probability distribution over the, the angles. And these angles then allow you um, to, um, to uh, construct three-dimensional structures. So, and um, the angles, two angles correspond, uh, uh, or the space of two angles corresponds to a torus. So in order to uh, formulate this model, we use the bivariate from Mises cosine distribution on the, on the two-dimensional torus, which you see visualized over here. And this is, of course, where John and, uh, and Kanti were very important. So this is a hidden Markov model. So it's, it doesn't represent long-range interactions between amino acids. It's only locally valid. So long-range interactions are not uh, captured. So what you can do with this model is you can you can uh, sample structures from this model that represent uh, what the local structure of, of, of a protein might look like at a, a certain position. So this was all before uh, uh, deep learning. So um, we actually constructed uh, a software package called Mockapi 
uh, that was called Mockup Plus Plus that allowed you to to formulate these probabilistic models and and estimate them automatically using a stochastic expectation maximization. So this was basically um, a um, uh, a, uh, already an, an, an early example of probabilistic programming, or we didn't know it was called uh, um, uh, it was called that at the time. So this is a software package that allows you to formulate models and then do automatic estimation. And this idea is uh, what I want to discuss uh, next. Uh, this is basically the idea behind a probabilistic program. So let's take a look uh, in the last uh, minutes. We'll try not to uh, go too much over time. Um, uh, take a look at deep probabilistic program. So deep probabilistic programming is about formulating um, open box models and combining them with black box inference engines. So for example, you can formulate a linear regression model and then you can obtain a point estimate, a maximum likelihood estimate or a map estimate using a stochastic variational inference. You can also plug in a different uh, inference engine, so for example, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and then you get a, a set of samples that approximate the Bayesian posterior. So again, so the model specification, that's open box, so you specify your model, but then hopefully the inference can be to a great extent or completely automated. So that's the, the core idea of probabilistic programming, and that really brings uh, Bayesian statistics uh, to the 21st century. So automatic inference comes in two, two big flavors. So you can either use Markov chain Monte Carlo, and this is typically done using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So you get a number of samples uh, that uh, give you an approximation of the posterior, or you can also do optimization. And in that case, you use something called stochastic variational inference. Um, and in the case of stochastic variational inference, so this can be used for very large models, which is not the, the, the case for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So stochastic variational inference can be used for, um, or is used for these, these very big uh, deep learning models. Uh, and uh, it can deal with, with uh, a large number of uh, parameters. And later on, so in the, in the last ta talk in this series, so you will hear about another inference method called uh, Stein variational inference, which goes beyond the possibilities of uh, stochastic variational inference. So here's a Bayesian linear model. So um, very simple. So it relates x to y using a, a normal distribution um, where you calculate the mean uh, from x with uh, using two parameters. There's also uncertainty. So we have some priors over these parameters. So this is what it looks like in a probabilistic programming language. Uh, this is the uh, probabilistic programming language by MC3. You can see that this mathematical description basically corresponds uh, uh, almost one-to-one -one, uh, to the, the, the computer program. So you specify some, uh, some priors, you define the likelihood, and then you do the inference. So in this case, uh, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is used. So deep probabilistic programming uh, combines the, the scope of deep learning with the principal treatment of uncertainty of, of Bayesian statistics. So basically, probabilistic uh, models become computer programs, and it's possible to, uh, to combine probabilistic constructs, priors, likelihoods, and so on, and so on, with arbitrary complex algorithms, so including, including recursion, and so on, and so on. So computer programs become probabilistic models, and this is, of course, a very, a very powerful uh, idea. So this combines the, the scope of deep learning, so also the uh, possibilities that you get from using neural networks uh, with the possibilities that you get from careful uh, statistical modeling uh, using the Bayesian approach. So there are a couple of, of, uh, of programs, a couple of software packages that you can use uh, uh, to do this. So there's PyMC3, uh, there's Spyro, and these, these, um, these um, probabilistic programming languages, so they use the the, the software that is also typically used for deep learning applications. So the software such as TensorFlow and such as PyTorch. So, so, by, by, so basically it's putting a Bayesian layer on top of uh, the deep learning uh, infrastructure. So we're ma mainly using Pyro, uh, which is a probabilistic programming language based on PyTorch. Um, so the main inference engines are stochastic variational inference and uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This was originally developed at Uber, but it's now at the Broad Institute. So it's now in an, uh, developed in an academic setting. 
So the Broad Institute is a collaboration between MIT and Harvard, and uh, and my group is actively involved in in uh, in uh, in the software development of this uh, of this pro probabilistic programming package. So we've uh, donated several uh, probability distributions, and we've also um, uh, um, contributed a, a library to do Stein variational inference. So this is very easy to install, um, and you can also run it on Google Colab if you want to play around with it. Okay, so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to um, uh, wrap up by just introducing the the, um, the talks that you're going to hear uh, uh, um, uh, in uh, in a couple of weeks. So the first talk will be uh, the 9th of February, and this will be done by uh, Christian Tugesen, so one of my PhD students. So this was work that was published in uh, ICML in 2021. So this is a uh, a model of protein structure again model of local protein structure but this time it's a deep probabilistic model so it's based on a deep markov model where you have uh, the amino acid sequence here at the top so you pull this amino acid uh, sequence through a recurrent neural network feed it into a deep markov model and then uh, you um, you infer uh, the parameters of uh, the distributions over the the backbone angles the phi and psi angles so this allows you um, given the amino acid sequence to sample plausible conformations of local structure. This is again a, a model of local structure, but we are actively uh, working on extending this, um, this local model with a 3D likelihood, so it will be possible to actually also model long-range interactions uh, with this model. So that will be the topic of the, the first uh, talk or the second talk. And then the third talk, this will be done by PhD student Ola Running. The, that will be the 16th of February. So he will talk about uh, Stein variational inference. So Ola developed a composable uh, library for the uh, probabilistic programming language NumPyro, which is a variant of Pyro. And um, so this uh, provides uh, NumPyro uh, with uh, Stein variational inference. So this is an important uh, development because it goes beyond the point estimates for the neural network that uh, that you can obtain from stochastic variational inference. So typically you just get a point estimate of the neural network parameters, but sign variational inference, which a kernel based uh, method approximates the posterior with a set of particles. So, so you, you, you go beyond the point estimate and you can actually represent the uncertainty over the parameters of the, of the uh, neural networks. So just in a, in a nutshell, so how does it work? So basically, um, you you um, you have these particle positions. So you start with an initial configuration of your particle positions, with, with, which uh, which represents the um, which uh, represent the, um, the the posterior, and then you're going to update these positions, and these positions are going to be updated using so-called Stein forces, and these Stein forces contain contain in an attractive force. S plus, which moves the particles towards the posterior modes. So this is this expression over here. And then you also have a repulsive, repulsive force, which presents, uh, which prevents the collapse of all the particles onto one node of the posterior. So in this, this combination of repulsive and attractive forces is then used to update um, the, uh, the positions of the particles that approximate the posterior. And you will get a lot more detail uh, from Ola in a couple of weeks. So let's uh, conclude here. And uh, so I hope that um, that I, I uh, convinced you that deep probabilistic program is a very interesting uh, development, both in machine learning and in statistics. So deep probabilistic pro programming combines the principal treatment that you get from Bayesian statistics with the scope of deep learning. So you can uh, train very large models. You can use uh, deep neural networks. But at the same time, you can also um, take care of the probabilistic modeling of uh, epistemic and uh, aleatory uncertainty. So the protein folding problem, even though to a great extent it's it's solved, yes, we we can um, we can predict uh, the structure of proteins based on on the sequence. But there are some things that are still missing. Um, it's difficult to to predict the effect of point mutants. It's difficult to predict. Um, it's difficult to predict uh, the dynamics of proteins, and, and we can certainly do better with respect to modeling all the, the sources of noise that are associated with, this, uh, with this, uh, this problem. So the protein folding problem has become somewhat of a paradigm problem for probabilistic machine learning. And so we're very interested in developing deep generative models 
um, that can uh, that can address this problem. And uh, we are also interested in developing the 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 advanced inference methods that are needed to estimate such uh, such models. And so we're very interested in, in exploring Stein variational inference uh, in, in this respect. So if you want to read up about the, the, the topic of the next talk, so you can find uh, this article here at the website of ICML. Um, so this, this will describe what, what, uh, what the next talk by uh, Christian Tugensen will be about. So these are some of the people that uh, were involved in the in the project. So um, so uh, lots of the uh, so the uh, some of this work was done in collaboration with uh, Evaction, which is an, uh, uh, a company that uh, develops uh, vaccines uh, using AI technology. So uh, Christian uh, um, is the the PhD student who has been working on the the local model uh, based on the Deep Markov model. So uh, and another Christian and Anders. Uh, were uh, at Evaction were also involved in this. And these are uh, some of the people who are uh, involved in, in, uh, in the, uh, developing these deep probabilistic models for protein structure, PhD student uh, Liz and Ola and uh, assistant professor uh, uh, Ahmed. And finally, I would like to acknowledge some of my international collaborators. So Fritz uh, is, uh, um, we're, we are developing uh, high performance uh, computing um, uh, uh, methods to run these models uh, on, uh, very efficiently on a GPU. So Fritz uh, is an expert in this uh, area. Jotun, uh, uh, who's at Oxford, uh, uh, is a collaborator who helps, up, helps us with, um, with including evolution into these problems. And then uh, Kanti and Christoph, um, they are uh, important for helping us with uh, directional statistics, and, and Christophe is also involved in uh, in helping us with uh, uh, with uh, Stein uh, with the intricacies of Stein uh, variational inference. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much, Thomas, uh, for a very neat and clear presentation. Uh, I, I would like to open the discussion. So whoever likes to take voice, just switch on your mic and a camera maybe. Oh, I can see Jakub? some camera from. Jakub, can yes. I ask a question? Yes, please, okay. Olga, please do so. I um, don't know if you see. Hello, hi, Thomas. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really, really clear and interesting. I have one um well three questions i guess i i will not do it all of the three um so you mentioned that there are some proteins that uh, folds uh, more than others um so it's, you know class of proteins that uh, have this ability others that don't sometimes when they don't fold the protein they should fold properly they don't fold properly they cause a disease so I was wondering what is the, the driving force behind folding um, properly uh, in, in a way, and I, I guess there should be some thermodynamics behind. So, um, so the process of folding, uh, in the case of you know the class of protein that should fold, must be thermodynamic favorable. Therefore, probably looking at kind of Gibbs free energy of system would help. You mentioned that um, uh, people use force field for prediction. Do you know about uh, people using um, thermodynamics model and looking at potential um, as a kind of uh, driving force um, for this mechanism? That's my first question. My second question is about the molecular chaperones. So I, I read, uh, you know, some times ago that um, there are some uh, proteins that aid other proteins to fold um, for the correct folding. And I'm not sure if that's taken into account in the model because there must be something really important there, you know, um, for, you know, the different class of protein. And the interesting thing is that those uh, chaperones apparently disappeared in the kind of new proteins, and you can only see them in vivo. So I spent quite a long time with biophysics, uh, with a group of biophysicists who were looking at folding proteins. So that's why this talk was very useful for me. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. 
Okay, yeah, good questions. Uh, so first of all, yes, of course, thermodynamics are, that's very important, uh, Gibbs free energy and, and things like that. So proteins, they basically um, are thought to be um, term, thermodynamically stable, so they fall to the minimum Gibbs free energy. So they're not like diamonds, you know, diamonds look stable, but they're actually unstable. So they are yeah. kinetically trapped. Proteins are not like diamonds in the sense that, you know, they are actually reached or they are they, they are thought to reach the, the, the minimum free energy. So that's that's one thing. Um, yes. So, of course, a lot of, of work is done with um, folding proteins using empirical force fields. Um, some, sometimes oft, it's often a, a combination of physical modeling and statistics. For example, Rosetta uses these these fragments from known protein structures and then combines that with with energy functions that, that are more physical. So it's a hybrid approach. Um, with respect to modeling thermodynamics, I think that this will this will become very important. Right now, uh, AlphaFold, for example, just tries to predict the final structure. Mm -hmm. The next uh, step is then also to predict the folding process and then also predict all of these thermodynamic quantities, right? Uh, what is it, specific heat and uh, Gibbs free energy and all of that stuff. So I think that, that that will become more important in the in the future. But I think that the problem there is that, that it will be, it's still, there is not that much data with respect to these these measurements. This is very limited. This is also very noisy data. So this is a lot more challenging. Um, but but it's it's very interesting. And there's, for example, there's a, a force field uh, called uh, prophecy, um, which mm -hmm. is uh, which is tuned. Uh, so th that was work done in in Sweden um, by the group of Anders Irbeck. And that's a force field that is that is that folds proteins. And so they're not only interested in, in reproducing the final structure, but also reproducing all these, these thermodynamic quantities. So, okay. so, that's, so, so it's definitely something that people are aware of. Yeah. Um, then with respect to the chaperones, uh, chaperones are very important in, uh, in, in vivo because the proteins often, the, the, as you could see from the first picture, a cell is a densely packed uh, bag full of proteins, essentially. So, and... If you if your protein needs to fold in such a crowded environment, it will interact with all other proteins and it will aggregate, and then things go wrong. So chaperones are needed to fold proteins in uh, in in packed environments. But if you would so if you would fold the same protein in a diluted environment, it would actually fold to the right structure. So chaperones are thought to to help the protein to reach the thermodynamic minimum that is encoded in the sequence but they do not kinetically trap the protein in another conformation however there are there are exceptions i think i know of one or two exceptions where it seems that the protein is actually kinetically trapped in a different conformation but in general chaperones only help reaching the the, the final conformation they, they do not induce it okay awesome. Thank you so much. So perhaps we can discuss about the thermodynamic modeling. I'm, I'm um, very happy to send you some uh, relevant re uh, references and, and stuff like that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Yeah, could, could I ask a question? Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, so, uh, Thomas. Thanks for, a lot for the talk. It was super interesting and very clear. Uh, I, uh, I'm wondering if you could go back to slide 11, maybe so that we can go again on the basic assumption of the folding. Sorry that you need to do the sharing again. One moment. Um... It's just that I'm not sure I understood. Uh, and if I ask the other questions, it would help me. Screen. Oh, sorry. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to slide 11. This yeah. one? Yeah, that's the basic assumption behind everything. So is, is it basically that you, there is some correlation between uh, the, let's say, amino acids that are coded by the basic, the bases along the DNA, so each, uh, codon which will then give you an amino acid which is either r k and so on so there is but what i didn't understand is 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 how that correlation works so you if you if you you know that if you have w at one place one place and v at the other 
then there will be a certain conformation or a certain shape. But if you have W and E, for example, then uh, there is a, some probability that the shape is different than, than the other one, right? So, something like that. Is, that. is that basically meaning that there is a, some sort of one-to-one -one almost mapping between the, uh, the changes between two amino acids and the resulting shape? Is that roughly? No, the... no, no. It's, oh. it's, it's, a, it's a bit like this. Um, so, so. <laughs> Let's say R, that's, uh, uh, that's arginine, and uh, D, that's uh, uh, aspartate. And so arginine is positively charged and aspartate is negatively charged. Yeah. So that means that you have a favorable interaction, right? So plus, minus. So K and E is the same thing. So this is uh, ly lysine and glutamate. So again, positive, negative, great. Favorable electros electrostatic interaction. W and V, so tryptophan and valine, these are hydrophobic amino acids. They also like to be together, right? So it seems that these amino acids, they always like to, to be close together. Suppose that you would have uh, situations where you have uh, two R's, you know, instead of RD, you would have mm. RR. So if you have a lot of, co the, these two amino acids would not prefer to be close together because they would, they would repel each other. Two positive charges would repel each other, right? Okay. So, so, so that means that 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 this is not favorable. So you can see that if you if you see that these two positions, they always seem to have a pair of amino acids that have a favorable interaction with each other, electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions. If that is the case, it's probably because they're close together, right? So it's not so much that you can you can deduce the structure from from the nature of the amino acids at these positions, but it's just if they they seem to change in such a way that there's always a pair that likes to be in proximity, and that means that you can you can uh, you can deduce or you can infer that these two amino acids that are far apart in the sequence come close together in the three D structure. Okay, so it's like uh, thanks a lot, very very clear. So it's basically then you could do it combinatorially, like uh, looking at all possible combinations and do this horrible. Uh, uh, problem of trying to match all the pairs and so on. Okay, I see. Yeah, actually, it's a bit tricky because because um, you get a lot of false positives because if 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 A is close to B and B is close to C, right? A might not be close to C, but they will still be correlated yeah. because you you have these indirect interactions. But it can be solved. Um, so the first method to solve this was based on a Markov random field, and now but now this is done. Use this is basically. The signal that the deep uh, that the, the the deep neural networks pick up. So the the, right. the success of AlphaFold is essentially <coughs> due to the fact that that it can uh, it can deduce these close contacts from uh, from these fa from these mutations in multiple sequence alignments. Yes, because it could be non-local, like not one to one, but group to group, like uh, a group of three amino acids in a row interacting with. Two or three others somewhere else. Yeah. 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 And the neural networks they go beyond pairwise interactions, right? So they can they can model much more general uh, interactions. It's a bit black box, but much more powerful. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. So I have another question, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. which is related to the parameterization. So how do you uh, you were talking about the fact that there are dihedral angles? And that was apparently in your argumentation linked to the fact that we are on a non-Euclidean space, uh, which I could not completely understand. And then I saw some tori around, which Christoph last time ex explained to me, uh, which allowed me to understand a bit the parameterization. But my question is, how do you determine the topology of the space or even, uh, yes, the topology of the space on which the parameters are varying, if it's a 2D tori or a 3D torus, 3D torus, 3D torus, whatever, plane, sphere. How, how do you know that? How do you determine this? Yeah, uh, good question. So, so here you see um, one amino acid, right? So in, in gray, you have the, you have the, uh, you have the local, um, let's say the, the, the linear polymer, right? And this is the so-called side chain of an amino acid, right? Yeah. So, so if you forget about the side chain, so if you only look at the at the backbone here, right? So so you have these two di dihedral angles that determine the conformation of the amino acid, right? So phi and psi. Hmm. So that's so one angle, one dihedral, and a dihedral angle is basically it can be represented on a circle, right? From zero to to pi and then back to zero, right? So it's basically yeah. point on the on the circle. So if you have two <coughs> angles, <clears throat> then um, 
these two angles that corresponds to a torus right okay. because you have like the product of two circles which is just a torus right so if you want to model two angles the joint distribution of these two angles that's a distribution on the torus so okay. and that's why you end up with with uh with this uh this picture over here right um let's see yeah so each amino acid corresponds to one uh, corresponds to one probability distribution on the 2D torus. So okay. if you have a 100 dimensional, or if you have a protein with 100 amino acids, then you have a 200 dimensional uh, hypertorus, basically. And we model that using a hidden Markov model, where each uh, emission here, which corresponds to one amino acid, so one pair of angles, one pair of five psi angles, so this corresponds to one tori distribution on the torus. Okay, very very clear. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So, so it's very it's, it's very clear what the dimensionality is and also what the what the what the manifold is that you need to to represent the, these non Euclidean variables. So, so the, the protein folding problem and also the the problem of comparing proteins and stuff uh, stuff like that. So these related proteins that they're they're kind of a very rich playing field for for directional statistics. So it's all about rotations, angles, directions, and so on. Okay, cool. It's very clear. Uh, thanks a lot. And just one last one, because I may have to leave at some point, um, which is related to the environment of the protein. Um, I guess these things are in water, usually in the cells. I mean, there is a lot of water around. And I suppose that the environment will have quite an effect on the folding and the, everything else. A, a bit like Olga was asking, I mean, a bit similar questions with, with the Gibbs free energy. And I'm wondering, let's say, how it seems to me that this is maybe not part of what is already solved right it's probably part of what is not yet solved but i i don't know uh how how true that is because the water molecule is you know has an orientation it's like a, a dipole so uh, i guess the 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 plus si the plus side of the h2o molecule will tend to go towards the negatively charged uh, and whatever and it will look like some hedgehog or something, but I I, I don't know uh, what is known and what's not known. Could you tell us a bit? Yes, so, so water is very important, right? Uh, so it's, it's uh, so I, th I think that Olga asked a question, forgot to answer it. So what's the driving force behind it? So basically the driving force is push the, the fatty amino acids, so the water avoiding amino acids to the center of the molecule, push them away from water. So this is a very... Um, um, so this this is a process that that uh, where, where entropy is, is is extremely important, and um, so so you need water to actually fold the proteins. So if you if you remove water, then the protein wouldn't be folded, right? Um, and um, so if you want to do physical simulation of protein folding, so often water molecules are either explicitly included in the simulation or they are implicitly represented. So using some kind of mean field approach. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, one thing, and another thing that I want to to mention is that um, so uh, so when we crystallize proteins, so so uh, the the PDB database, the database of known protein structure, contains uh, typically or for the majority, these are are structures that have been solved by X-ray crystallography, and that means that you have protein crystals. But we're very very lucky that we can we can crystallize proteins in a way so that so these crystals they contain about fifty percent water. So, so these crystals are actually um, are, are actually saturated with water, and that means that the proteins will remain folded. Otherwise, proteins wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to crystallize proteins because without water, their three dimensional st structure uh, is not stabilized. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'll uh, leave space for others. Thank you for your talk. The, our group is is going to be very keen to to follow up on some on some points. And since Christoph is just sitting next to me, I think it's gonna make things a bit easier. Thank you so much for taking the time and taking so much time actually. Thank yeah, you. You're very welcome. So if there's any anything specific that you would like to uh, um, explore, then you're always welcome to contact me for some references or or with questions. That's great. Thank you so much. May I have a question? Uh, related maybe again to this physics-based uh, modeling, uh, do you know of any approaches, probably there are such, such uh, that use this alpha fold for predictions as a um, starting point to have some more accurate 
uh, further predictions of, of this protein structure, sort of uh, take this configuration as a starting point and then applied some ab initio physical models that could uh, further improve the predictions of, of the of the 3D structures. I'm, I'm yeah. asking this because you showed some, I don't remember which slide was it, but you showed some physical model involving uh, Leonard Jones potential. And we are currently working on, on some project on with physics department on some long range interactions, which you also mentioned, uh, that involve these multi-body correlations and um, which is a, an extension to Leonard Jones potential to a multi uh, interactions. And uh, maybe this is a kind of avenue to go into, but probably you know much more about this. If you could comment on that, that would be good. Um, I'm, people might be doing this. Um, so of course you, you can imagine that people are, that a lot of groups are now exploring what you can use uh, AlphaFold for. And they're often being, uh, they're often very creative uh, with it, uh, so applying alpha folds in ways that uh, um, that uh, that uh, that are a bit unexpected. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any groups that are using alpha folds together with uh, with physical simulations, but that it might that, that there might well be publications on this, but I I don't uh, I don't know. Um, there is, however, another method um, which, which is called NEMO, uh, which might be interested, interesting to, to uh, take a look at that uh, appeared a couple of years ago. And uh, so this is not something that, 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 that provides very good predictions, but it's a very interesting method. And that's basically um, a, a method that folds uh, proteins um, using a, uh, an energy function that is calculated using a neural network. Uh, so it's uh, it's it, it, it actually tries to fold, to simulate the folding using uh, using deep methods, and uh, the main author of this work was uh, John Ingraham. Uh, I don't okay. think that this work is continued, but um, but there are several groups that are are are, uh, are interested in folding proteins using deep methods, and we're, we're also doing research in that uh, in that uh, area. I see because we, you mentioned that. Uh... In principle, the protein is uh, uh, falling into this global minimum, uh, which is uh, very, I, I would say, surprising because uh, you can expect that this is a, a non-convex problem to be solved with dynamics involved and all uh, other dependencies, so which is a path dependency. Um, so why, in principle, why, why one could expect that at, in the end you will fall into some local minimum if you have so many possible configurations, which are probably, there's no continuous uh, link or path between them. You would need to unfold probably and fold in a different configuration to fall in some better minimum. Why at all it is possible? Can you, can you comment on that maybe? Yeah, so there, there's this famous uh, concept of the folding funnel, right? So that the amino acid sequence not only, it not only determines the final structure, but also the way to get there. So, so the sequence actually encodes a smooth way to, to get to the folded conformation. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so, so there's this Leventhal paradox, um, mm -hmm. which is from the, I think from the 60s uh, or something. So which is the simple back of the envelope calculation that uh, how long would it take to just go through all possible um, configurations? Um, exactly. And, and then taking into account the time that it takes to go from one co configuration to the other, that would be longer than the, the age of the universe, basically. So it has mm. to be, so the folding process has to be extremely targeted, so some kind of energy funnel, so that the, that the, the, the protein kind of makes adjustments and immediately uh, falls into, uh, into energy, into free energy minima. And mm. it goes from one minima to the other, so it's kind of shaped mm. like a funnel. It's not mm. a, golf, a golf course, because th that would take forever. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. not a golf but, course with a hole in it because that that, that yeah. you, you wouldn't be able to get to get to the hole. So so it must be some kind of valley. Yeah. But it, it is really, let's say, proven or, or certain that this is a really global minimum that that is taken. Uh, There's a lot of work on this. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's um, yeah, there's both both theoretical work and, and experimental work. Yeah. So and also the this wow. this full this funnel. Uh, Fuddle hypothesis. There's there are many publications about this. Yeah, oh, there's uh, for example Ken Dill. Ken Dill, a physicist, has done a lot of work on, on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think we should skip a further question to this offline connection with you, uh, or maybe to the further presentation in the next week or in two weeks, because we are already 10 past 11. Uh, so thank you so much, Thomas, for your presentation again, and we are very looking forward for the uh, next two presentations from your group. Um, the recording will be published on our website, so the people who would not could not appear today, they can, they can catch up with the material and, and be prepared for the next presentation. Uh, Thanks so a lot for, have, have a uh, good yeah, day. Thanks a lot for the invitation, and uh, I, I will see you uh, in uh, two weeks. Yes, and I, I guess that you're planning to come here to Luxembourg, right? In, yeah. in the future. Yeah. So that will be another opportunity maybe to interact. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah. Thank you so much again. Have a good day to everybody. Bye.